The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. More than 7 million people in Canada are older than 64. That's just shy of 20% of us. I'm one of those people. The issues all seniors face include, but are not limited to, financial security, health care, and an end to ageism. Rudy Boutignon, the president of the Canadian Association of Retired Persons, or CARP, represents associations across the country advocating with all levels of government on behalf of 330,000 members. According to Boutignon, the greatest obstacle to achieving better societal outcomes for seniors is overcoming ageism. There is a generally held belief that as you age, your body and mind are going to fall apart, you're going to become grumpy and lonely, and you're going to get sick. Boutignol says that's simply not true. They are, those assumptions, he says, the basis, however, of bias that is directed at seniors. Those attitudes towards seniors impact so many other aspects of their lives. It's why families worry that seniors can't remain in their homes. It affects the way healthcare providers treat senior patients. In other words, it's discrimination. Since 1983, CARP has been working to combat stereotypes about seniors. The organization also advocates for tax policy changes that will support home care, reframing the concept of retirement residents from institutions to homes. I invited Rudy Boutignol to join me for a conversation that matters about aging well and why we need to respect our elders. Rudy, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Ageism is such an interesting uh, element of the way that uh, people who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, maybe even into their, you know, the, the next century get treated and dismissed. It's part of our culture, and I think North American culture is particularly guilty of it. I do a lot of work in Asia, for instance, and the attitudes towards elders is completely different. You know, you have an elder steps into a room and uh, people um, uh, pay deference to that mm -hmm. individual, knowing that they're, uh, you know, a senior citizen, that they have exalted status, that they know stuff. And in North America, we have this youth culture that the minute you're no longer, uh, you know, formally in the workplace, you're no longer used to the, uh, of use to society in terms of producing anything, you're kind of shunted aside. And I think that that attitude infuses everything in terms of how we deal with people once they get into those uh, senior years. Stephanie Cadu, who is the uh, accessibility um, ambassador in Canada, uh, says, uh, our society is around ableism and we look at people and go, oh, if you're not quite like me, well, then maybe uh, you don't deserve uh, the same kind of access to opportunity. But are we not then cutting out a tremendous amount of experience, insight, knowledge uh, and, you know, members of the workforce that can contribute in so many other ways? Yes, in fact, even more so now that we've transitioned from, you know, the industrial age to the knowledge age where where all of a sudden it's the, you know, it's what you've maintained in your brain is the knowledge you've built up uh, that can be transferred from uh, mentorship and, and uh, internships and the like and to let people go or force them out of the workplace when they have this tremendous amount of knowledge is, is this waste, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, we need those people to stay in the workplace if that's what they want to do. Uh, not everybody wants to work, but as the cost of living goes up, a lot of people are forced to work and, and they have a tremendous amount of um, value to a productive society. One of my uh, favorite kind uh, pieces that was written uh, about aging came from Pablo Casals. It was I called know. A Salute to Life. And he talked about the fact that uh, he does not feel old at the time, and he was 92, does not feel old in the normal way because every day he was still discovering uh, elements of the music that he was playing or anything else that were new, exciting, and, and enriching. So what is it that we need to be able to do to and demonstrate that people, to, to those who are looking at somebody who's older, just because somebody isn't in the workforce the way that maybe you are, doesn't mean that they're not contributing in ways that have great value. You know, there's an interesting um, uh, thought around the word retirement. 
April. Yes. And in fact, even our organization kind of wanted to stay away from the word retirement because it meant like, well, that's it, you're done. Right. And uh, for almost everyone, re what retirement means in our society is I'm retired from that thing I used to have to do uh, to pay the bills, to pay the mortgage, to raise the family. I'm not retired from life. And yep. in fact, so people like Pablo Casals, the brilliant musician, um, what's the secret to long life and a, and a good life is staying engaged, mentally and physically uh, engaged in the process. And we need to uh, remember that with seniors to like, these people are not ready for the rocking chair necessarily. Uh, more and more, we're living longer, healthier lives. We are capable of doing more. Not that everybody wants to or can, but many more people can. And so staying engaged um, is really important. And removing the barriers to people staying engaged. For instance, remember when retirement was mandatory at 65? Well, CARP was one of the uh, advocates that uh, uh, helped abolish that rule, saying a lot of people enjoy work mm -hmm. and they want to work. So let's make sure that they can. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. You know, one of the perceptions, of course, is that as people age, you start to lose your mental capacity. And there's this idea and also fear that I might uh, slide into dementia or worse, Alzheimer's. But the stats really don't back that up, do they? No. I, look, eventually we're all going to die. <laughs> You know? This is true. But, but the point yeah. is that we age um, in differently, every, you know, depending on genetics, on your you know, good luck, and on, on you know, the kind of uh, life you've led. Um, but most people can remain active for a really long time. Uh, individually, some people succumb to disease earlier than others. But it's really looking at the individual and what they're capable of and what is their state, state of health. You know, and a lot of nowadays, uh, people well beyond 65 are still fully engaged. And so it's not, you know, you have to look at the individual, not just this group of this cohort that you decide is useless. Well, I was looking at the stats and it says the number of people who are experiencing dementia as they age yeah. is actually decreasing on a percentage of population. Uh, so it's not a foregone conclusion that as you age, you're going to start to lose that capacity. In fact, you know, all suggestions are that your brain remains vital and active so long as you continue to use it. Uh, that's the key, you know, staying engaged. It's, for instance, why hearing aids are so important, you know, that some people as they um, uh, age and, and their uh, hearing gets affected, it degrades from a very noisy environment. It's getting hearing aids turns out to be really, really important, not just for the benefit of your partner and your friends, but also uh, to stay engaged yourself because, you know, we've seen where people that lose their hearing uh, or have diminished hearing and don't get help start to disengage. Yes. And that's when the trouble comes. One of the other vital components, of course, is staying physically active. Um, uh, Dr. Ken Rockwood uh, at Dalhousie University in uh, Halifax uh, has gone and created the uh, frailty scale. And he says the most important thing that you have to do is stay off that frailty scale. But to your point about uh, winding up there and about hearing, you need to be socially engaged. Uh, otherwise, you don't motivate yourself the same way to get out there and do the things that are going to keep you vital. I agree totally. I yeah. still play hockey twice a week, and it's pretty high-paced. It's a lot of fun. At least I think it's high-paced by my standards. <laughs> I know that when they take videos, it looks like, like slow motion. But it's not just the physical activity of, of, of uh, playing hockey. It's, um, you know, twice a week. I look forward to getting together with the guys, and there's all the hubbub in the, in the dressing room and the kidding and everything. And it's the camaraderie. It's the social aspect that really uh, becomes important. And that, that's what uh, I think keeps people healthy and, and being um, socially engaged, being uh, with it, not starting to retreat. And of course, physical activity is really important as well. We have to also stay off that couch. Yes. So one of the other uh, misconceptions is that, well, uh, as you get older, everybody winds up in, in a, uh, a facility, uh, assisted living facility. Once again, the statistics do not back that up, but uh, the, like the tax laws and the things that we need to have in place so that people can stay at home, 
don't necessarily help us, especially when it comes to our own family members coming and being part of our network of help. You know, we have this very institutional mindset, you know, that uh, you can, as soon as you can't stay home, we're going to put you in the institution. Somebody else will look after you. Staying at home is probably the overwhelming preference uh, of everyone. They want to stay at home as long as possible to the end as pos uh, if possible. And the best way to do that is to, is to keep people um, healthy and to make sure that they have the needs and the supports that they need. And sometimes that can just be a, um, a relative that can spend a few hours every day or check in every day or even a neighbor. And yet we don't incentivize that system. We either go from you stay at home on your own, uh, you know, uh, on your own steam, and if not, you go into an institution. And in terms of people's well-being, I've experienced with my mother is the minute they go into an institution, they lose interest in life. Mm -hmm. you know, even, no matter how good that institution is, it's not home. There's a huge loss. So creating the incentives for a loved one to stay home and help out. Uh, I think that's the way we have to go. And also with the baby boom aging, there's no way that institutionally we'll be able to deal with the aging population. So one of the challenges that I understand is the, uh, re uh, the regulations around tax. So I hire somebody, uh, I can pay them, and that there, you know, there is some tax benefit. But if it's a family member, well, no, now I'm not allowed to hire them under sort of the rules from the CRA. And it's as though those rules get in the way of being able to really live the best possible life at home, especially when we're in our more advanced years. Yeah, that's the, yeah, it's kind of crazy, right? It's almost uh, this idea that uh, socially, well, if it's a loved one, you should be doing it anyways. Never mind that you, uh, that loved one has their own family to raise, their own obligations, work and everything. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it's a social attitude. It's, it's sort of like, well, why should I bet it? You know, why should we taxpayers have to pay you to look after a loved one? Uh, not knowing that socially, like it, it's actually much more efficient. Keeping people out of institutions, keeping them in their home is far more efficient and uh, a better way to, to uh, support our people as they age. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Well, there's a healthcare benefit to that too. So if somebody is staying at home, they're happier. When you're happier, we know your immune system is more resistant to a whole host of uh, different diseases or illnesses. And so therefore we're keeping you out of the, or reducing the amount of times that you have to go uh, visit a healthcare provider, giving space to other people who desperately need it. Yeah, so keeping people at home is what people want to do. And, uh, you know, just if you've experienced moving from one home to another, you know how traumatic that is. If you are forced out of your home knowing you're never going back, uh, that can be devastating. And, and, you know, going into a home, no matter how good it is, a lot of people lose interest in mm -hmm. life. Uh, and so keeping them at home keeps them healthy, keeps them happy as much as possible. Doesn't mean they're not grumpy, uh, but uh, it keeps them much more engaged. And it's, it's just important because of that, what home means to everyone. So you also are uh, working towards trying to get uh, tax laws around RRSP changed, as I understand, because the way that it is right at the moment, once you, you know, 71, I think, is the last year that you can contribute. Well, if you're not going to be actually stopping working and you're going to keep going for another 10 or 15 years, well, now you're being penalized for staying working um, because your tax uh, load changes. Uh, how do we go about and encourage those kinds of changes uh, that allow people to continue to earn money and then save for those days when they are going to need that in the future, that, those funds in the future? I think the biggest thing is to change the cultural mindset to say, look, when you're at 65 isn't what it is. Uh, it isn't today what it was years ago, especially mm -hmm. coming out of a, you know, the industrial age, the manufacturing age, where if you had a life of hard labor, or difficult um, working environment. Yeah, 65, you're, you're, you're ready to go. But for a lot of people, you know, 65 is, you know, you've still got another generation to go. And so mm -hmm. uh, the current model is all built around the idea that we would retire at 65. And so therefore our RSPs have to convert at 71. And so it's all yeah. built on an old model, not what the reality is of today.
you know, I was looking at where did this idea of retiring at 65 come up? And the, the closest I could find was that uh, Bismarck was asked, well, at what time, at what age should somebody retire? And he was, uh, I think he was about 70 when he was asked that question. <laughs> he said, 72. He says, because then you might live another year and you're ready to die. <laughs> and we squirreled it back to 65. And then you take a look at what the, uh, well, the uproar in France was about going from, what was 60, 61 back up to 63 or 4. Like, <laughs> yeah. there, there is this idea that somehow it is like a, a sacred trust that you should be allowed to retire. Yeah, I think, you know, we have to look at with a bigger population and, and a population that's aging, not only here in Canada, it's aging worldwide, uh, even in a big, big place like China. You know, yes. you have, it's, it's now on becoming a much older population. We have to change our attitudes first and realize that it's not what it was, you know, 65 today, thanks to, you know, well, medicine has a lot to do with it, you know, mm -hmm. that we don't succumb to some of those simple disease, diseases. Um, and just the fact that a lot of work is uh, handled by machines. So we yeah. don't, the, that hard physical labor here isn't what it used to be. And a 65 year old today, um, well, I'm I'm 72 and I'm out there playing hockey and I'm I'm pretty good you know, playing mm -hmm. defense. I'm not as fast as I used to be, but I'm keeping up to people that are younger than I am because um, I've lived a, a life of you know a white collar work, uh, yeah. and so my health is really good. So let's talk about uh, you know quality of life from a happiness perspective. It's my understanding that as you start moving beyond 65, you're actually moving into that zone where you're, you, you can easily be the happiest you've been in your entire life, other than when you were a, like a little kid and you didn't have anything to worry about. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, for a lot of people that have had the good fortune and, and, and good health, they've, um, you know, they've seen their children uh, grow up and they've paid off the mortgage. They've probably helped, helped their kids through university or college. They've helped, now they're helping with grandchildren. And, mm -hmm. and grandchildren are wonderful, right? It's all the benefits of parenting without the annoyance part. And the grandkids <laughs> always love you, even in the teenage years. And also you have the, you both have the means, for many of us, if you're fortunate, you have the means to really pursue what you wanna do on your own time. And uh, you have the benefit of this incredible perspective mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, six and a half decades on the planet and seeing how things work out. And there's a great satisfaction knowing that uh, you know you know more about the world you've gained hopefully some kind of wisdom and uh, it's easier to be at peace with your, your life and the world the production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you so one of the other elements of course is that you know we talk about yeah, we're being healthier and we're living longer, but even still, uh, you know, there's mitochondrial breakdown in the body. You age. Uh, there are. Uh, you're going to have ailments. You're going to need prescriptions, and for everybody, is different. The cost of that medication gets to be very, very high. Um, what? How, how can we work towards addressing that for people who do need that support? I think universal pharma care is really important because, you know, again, um, medicines as you grow older become uh, quite important, you know, even if it's as simple as uh, blood pressure or cholesterol, you know, and it's important that um, the focus on prevention, you know, is really important. So it's exercise, good food, social interaction, but also making sure that you have access to a family doctor, that you get to um, see the specialist you need to see when you need to see them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a maintenance, you know, you keep, you take care of your car, you go in for the regular checks, that car will last a long time. Well, and as we've discussed, I mean, we're talking about people who bring uh, uh, tremendous value to their families, their communities, and the world in which we live. What are a couple of the other areas that uh, CARP is helping people as we're in these different stages 
of, of aging. And I think it's important to say, just because you're over 65 doesn't mean that you're the same as everybody else who's over 65, because, you know, uh, people within that cohort could easily be 90. And they, their issues are different than somebody who's 65. So how else is CARB helping people in, in these stages of our lives? Well, for, for instance, in home care, one of our um, cha very active chapters in Ottawa is really focused on fall prevention. Mm. You know, so that um, uh, so we're uh, promoting fall prevention, which means being very proactive if you want to remain in your home to make sure that those little things in your home get taken care of, especially if your eyesight degrades or, you know, you have a little mobility issues that all of a sudden you make sure that there aren't things in your home that can trip you up because, you know, a small trip. You break, a, you know, you break a bone because you're not quite as uh, elastic as you used to be, and, and that can set you off on a bad course you know, if you become bedridden and the like. So fall prevention is a big deal. There's another chapter that we have in Barrie, and they're looking at a different housing model. So for instance, um, the, there in that community, there's a lot of interest in the Golden Girls model. That is, ah. that there are predominantly women interested in um, still living in a house and being an owner of a house, but not a whole house to themselves. So they want to look at joint mm -hmm. uh, ownership. So sort of like a strata model within a home with individuals. So they're advocating for changes to municipal laws and to see if they can change the insurance industry's approach to something like that. So a cooperative housing model. Huh. So that's simple things. And I think with the housing crisis that we're in the midst of, uh, it's something that's not going to go away anytime soon and that there are going to be thousands of different solutions uh, to it. And people uh, taking individual initiatives are important. So this Golden Girls model is another one. So how, let's say somebody goes, okay, I've identified a problem and I, I think I've got a solution, but I keep running into barriers. How, how do you help them as an association as a, a, a retired persons uh, navigate their way through what can be complex regulatory environments? Well, we have the advantage of, being, of having 23 chapters across the country uh, from uh, Newfoundland, St. John's, wow. and uh, to Victoria, and Nanaimo, and many places in between. And so um, these chapters are volunteer chapters that we support uh, financially and with mailing lists and sponsorships. And they, um, on one hand, support uh, and provide consensus on our national advocacy priorities. And on the other hand, um, we enable these chapters to, to pursue uh, priorities that are specific to their own community. Mm -hmm. So for instance, some provinces are still advocating um, that government, provincial governments have a seniors advocate. In some provinces like uh, British Columbia, we have a seniors advocate, but now we're advocating that um, that individual shouldn't be reporting through the Ministry of Health, which is really big, but rather uh, become an officer of parliament and report directly to parliament. Mm -hmm. And so uh, through our chapters, we're able to let, uh, to deal with very specific issues. It could be municipal, regional, or even provincial, at the same time that we at National deal with the big um, Canada-wide advocacy priorities. So just to wrap up here, how can people get in touch with uh, you or the organization uh, to find out, uh, you know, where those, you know, areas of assistance uh, may lie. Well, um, if you want to join the community yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, discover the benefits, you go to carp.ca. C-A-R-P. C-A-R-P, and, and membership is, is uh, uh, 20 bucks, 30 bucks if you want the magazine as well, and uh, just the benefits alone pay for themselves almost instantly. Wonderful. Well, thank you for taking the time today to share, you know, what it is that CARP's doing, but also to address so many of these issues that are related to seniors. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.